This is CBC Here and Now. Long lineups for gasoline in the city of St. John's tonight. That's because the price is expected to go up by 14 cents a litre. We'll tell you why, coming up. A well-known lawyer pleads guilty to his third drinking and driving charge. Third time offender should be held to the proper standards by the law. She was at the center of controversy in Spaniards Bay. Now she's running for re-election. Win? I don't know if I can win. Those kids back there playing on the playground, they can't advocate on their own behalf. They need us adults to advocate for them. We will do that. The education minister on this summer's school report. Coming up, the latest on Hurricane Irma and some tropical moisture of our own. Increasing the humidity and bringing some rain at times heavy. The details are coming up. Our top story tonight, one as hot as the current temperatures. It's the price of gas. Yeah, it's expected the cost of fuel to, is going to jump tomorrow. An estimated 14 cents a litre as part of the fallout from flooding in Texas. Now that news has sent people flocking to fill up. Here and now is Jeremy Eaton is on that story tonight and he joins us from one of the busiest gas bars in the province. So Jeremy, how are things at Costco at the moment? Most times when you stop by Costco, there's usually a lineup, but tonight it's a lot longer than normal. An employee here told me that the first car started lining up at 615. Gas bar doesn't even open up until 6.30 in the morning. Now, the reason for this is that they're selling gas at $1.16.4 a litre. And when you wake up tomorrow morning, that number is going to be significantly higher. Now, George Murphy with the Consumer Group for Fair Gas Prices estimates that the price of gasoline will spike by 14 cents. So the big question, what impact is this going to have on your wallet? Let's take a quick look. If you're driving a Honda Civic and expect to fill up your tank tomorrow, you're going to shell out about $7 more than usual. If you're behind the wheel of a RAV4, it's more still, about $8.40 more. Lastly, if you drive a Ford F-150, you're going to be hit the hardest. Bigger tank, bigger bill. You can expect, expect to shell out more than $12 in gasoline. So to avoid a massive hit on the pocketbook, people are lining up here at Costco, but they're also lining up at other gas stations in the city to try to save a few bucks. Now, the reason for this flooding in Texas, but why we're going to find out more when we talk with George Murphy in about 30 minutes from now. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. Well, you're looking at... Hurricane Irma. Residents say it sounded like a jet engine when the storm slammed into the Dutch island of St. Martin. Irma is now being called the most powerful Atlantic hurricane on record, at least one of. It left extensive damage in uh, St. Bart's where the fire station is flooded with more than a meter of water. Then Irma churned northwest and is now moving into the U.S. and British Virgin Islands, which also are being hit head on and uh, there is a very impressive satellite shot and a pretty impressive shot here as well as we take a look at the latest go 16 image and there is the storm again just rolling north there's a puerto rico it's going to be north of puerto rico the center of the storm but again this thing spans seven to eight hundred kilometers wide so it is a massive storm that is hitting uh, puerto rico it still has gusts right now in the 360 kilometer per hour range so it has been a category five for more than 24 hours and uh, one of the only storms ever to be this strong for this long. In fact, it has set a record uh, for being this strong for more than 24 hours. Category 5, again, north of Puerto Rico. It will clip Dominican Republic over the next 24 hours, and then it will sail towards Cuba as we mo move towards the weekend. This hard right turn is what the forecast models are really having a difficult time with. The exact timing is going to be key for Florida. Latest National Hurricane Center track does clip Miami and then up towards the eastern parts of the Florida Peninsula. But you can see with some of the latest forecast model runs, still quite a spread in terms of where the exact track will be. And this is going to be key. Already seeing widespread flight cancellations for Miami. Southern Florida is likely going to be impacted here, but Central Florida, Orlando, up towards the northern sections, this is still a, a very much a, a moving target. 
when you're talking about a very hard right turn like this, it's tough for the forecast models to nail down whether this tracks over western Florida, eastern. Uh, this is going to be, again, something we have to watch over the next couple of days. States of emergency are obviously still in effect uh, for Florida as a result of that. So we're going to be watching that over the next uh, couple of days. See, when you lay it out like that, Ryan, and it is bearing down on millions of people, so it's uh, no uh, surprise that a lot of people are trying to get out of its path. Yeah, yeah Air Canada, WestJet, uh, Air Transat are all putting on extra flights and uh, giving people the option to rebook if they were originally set to, set to head south. That's right, and extra flights are going out to get people uh, and bring them back early. And have a look at this. I saw this earlier today. This is from, from Flight Radar on Twitter. All of those planes are headed to or from the Dominican Republic this afternoon. And look at the line coming from New York City in particular, all those JetBlue, WestJet, Air Transat flights all coming in. Again, we heard of many folks who are leaving a day or two early, obviously, and over just to the right-hand side of the bottom of your screen, that is Irma, that is, again, uh, bearing down on the Dominican. But, yeah, that's just one area. There's also uh, Cuba, where lots of people are cutting their vacations short. Florida is another area mm -hmm. where uh, yeah. extra flights have been put on in order to try and get people out. And, um, of course, we're talking about where the storm is headed, but it has already had a fairly big impact. And coming up a little later in the show, I'm going to talk to one Newfoundlander who... Uh, made it through Hurricane Irma overnight, so wow. we'll uh, talk to him a little later in the show. Guy who can survive a well, a member of the crew shooting a Hollywood movie in the province was stabbed last Friday in St. John's. The man was on George Street celebrating the end of the filming of Aquaman when he was attacked by someone with a knife. Police say three people were also injured as bystanders tried to subdue the attacker. A 22-year-old man from Mount Pearl is facing charges of aggravated assault and assault with a weapon. Aquaman stars frontier actor Jason Momoa and is slated for release in December of next year. A 47-year-old woman has died following an ATV accident near Gull Pond on the west coast. Police in Bay St. George were called to the single vehicle crash Tuesday morning. According to police, the woman was driving on a gravel road when the side-by-side -side tipped over. She was taken to hospital in Stephenville with serious injuries and died a short time later. Well-known defense lawyer Jeff Brace was in court this morning facing his third charge of impaired driving. Today, he changed his plea from not guilty to guilty. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. Lawyer Jeff Brace spends a lot of time in court. Usually, he's here defending people accused of committing crimes. But he's also been here facing impaired charges twice before. Brace was convicted in 1997 and 2011. Today, he changed his plea on his third charges from not guilty to guilty. His lawyer, Bob Simmons, says Brace has pleaded guilty to blowing over the legal blood alcohol limit. It's indescribable the pain that a family member has to feel. I don't want to see someone else lose another loved one. The national president of Mothers Against Drunk Driving was at provincial court today too. Her stepson, Nicholas Coates, was killed by a drunk driver in 2013. She wants Brace's sentence to send a strong message to the public. But we do believe that a third-time offender should be held to the proper standards by the law. A third conviction of impaired driving can result in a jail sentence of more than 100 days. Brace is due back in court for a pre-sentence hearing in December and is scheduled to be sentenced in January. Defence and Crown lawyers are expected to give the judge a joint submission outlining what they agree would be an appropriate sentence for Brace. Mark Quinn, CBC News. St. John's. The scars of controversy are still very fresh in one Conception Bay North town. As here announced Harry Roberts reports, some are hoping that this month's municipal election will signify a fresh start. It's nearing two years since Spaniards Bay entered the national spotlight. Accusations of sexual harassment on the fire department, pornographic movies at training sessions, mass resignations and a bitter divided town. Well, now it's election time and a wave of candidates have stepped forward, hoping to serve on council. 19 names, only seven openings, four gunning for mayor, 15 others for a seat on council. 
It's not a record here, but it's close. One of those vying for re-election was at the center of all that controversy. I know that each and every vote that I do get now is, go is going to be a sincere and genuine vote. And um, if that ends up to be a few, well, then I'll take that. I'm, um, I certainly um, do stand by everything that's happened. I do believe it's had, despite all the controversy, I believe it's had some very positive effects. The scene was tense not long ago. Seymour, the firefighter, making allegations of harassment. Firefighters quitting. Temperatures rising. A report earlier this year didn't help Seymour's cause. Her allegations unsubstantiated. She knows it's an uphill battle. Win? I don't know if I can win, but I'm happy to move on with the mindset that the people have chosen their council. And I would wish them all the best, the successful candidates, uh, when that time comes on the 26th of September. Meanwhile, there are plenty of fresh faces stepping forward. This candidate is ready to put the past in the past. We do have to move forward from that. I mean, we did have a report um, that had been completed um, and, you know, denied the accu accusations, confirmed that they were false. Um, so, you know, we're moving forward. The mood here seems to be one of renewal and not a return to moments like this. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Spaniards Bay. Whatever makes the most sense uh, for the communities that, that want to have us. The Choices for Youth group in St. John's wants to expand to other parts of the province. Up next, we'll tell you about their stop in Stephenville today. And one day down, only about 30 or so weeks to go. Many students got over their first day jitters as more schools across the province open today. Still ahead, we'll talk more about education.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A group in St. John's is looking to expand its services to help homeless youth across the province. Choices for Youth is touring the province with the aim of establishing a presence in six other communities. Here and Now's Colleen Connors met up with them in Stephenville today. It looks like any other lunch at the Lions Club, but these young people are brainstorming ways to improve life in their community. They're talking about drugs, jobs, dropouts, homelessness, and teen pregnancy. It's all part of Choices for Youth's plan to reach out beyond St. John's. We've seen a lot of clients who come from all over the province to access our services there. And so some people come to St. John's because they need to access services, or some people come to St. John's and end up in trouble and end up needing what we provide. But in both of those cases, those young people would often be so much better served with more services closer to home. A lot of homeless, I see a lot of it. So, and, um, the Metro Group wants to set up help for at-risk youth across the province. Consultations like this are happening here, Cornerbrook and St. Anthony this week to find out what youth need. Uh, in the Stephenville area, I think a lot of at-risk youth face things like you know mental health issues. We're looking at you know sustainable and affordable housing, uh, sustainable employment as well. There are many barriers in this area that we have to face. Choices for Youth has government money to expand and bring not necessarily facilities but services to help rural youth that are struggling. Their plan is to use the information from here to come up with an expansion plan. Well, now that lunch is over and the consultations are complete, the work for the group at Choices for Youth, well, it's just beginning. They hope to have services and information in the six communities outside of St. John's within the next two to three years. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Stephenville. Well, we've known there's a need out there, so this is the start of perhaps uh, the, the expansion of Choices for Youth. We'll wait and see how that develops. Great story there. Absolutely. Uh, as you can see, it was a nice day where mm -hmm. Colleen was, and it was a warm day. Uh, we're talking mm -hmm. about highs today, uh, generally in those mid-20s. Uh, it really was a nice one. As we take a look at uh, those highs, 26 in Badger. We get to 21 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. As we walk over to the green wall here, uh, we were talking about uh, temperatures that were warm. We were starting to feel a little bit of that humidity as well, but that will really start to ramp up as we move into tomorrow. The humidity really starting to rise, and you can see we're even up towards McCovic. We're near 19 degrees today, not half bad for this time of year. Current dew point, again, a very good measurement of how it feels out there. We're starting to get into that uncomfortable range, that 16, 17, 18 range. That will change as we move into tomorrow. As we watch our scale, uncomfortable to oppressive is 18 to 20, and anything north of 20 is certainly feeling very muggy. That'll be the setup for Thursday afternoon, and as we roll into Friday, more of the same for central and eastern, eastern Newfoundland in particular. Perhaps a bit of a break over areas of the west coast. Some drier air starting to push in uh, to uh, Labrador as we move into Friday. On the other side of this big frontal boundary, which is set up from southeastern Labrador all the way down the eastern seaboard and down into the Gulf of Mexico. And that is tropical moisture which is moving up. Uh, so downpours at times heavy, the name of the game tonight and even into tomorrow. And it's that warm air mass that is bringing in, yeah, that muggy feel. Heads up tonight, Northern Lights on the go. A very strong magnetic storm will have the Northern Lights uh, possibly visible, weather dependent, right across um, uh, most of Canada. Uh, by 9 p.m. tonight, temperatures are still into the high teens, low 20s. I think the best chance for viewing will be over the Avalon, northeastern Newfoundland into central. Along the south coast, I think onshore winds will blow in that, uh, that cloud cover and a bit of uh, some coastal fog there will likely limit any uh, viewing there. And across uh, parts of uh, Labrador, again, we are going to be seeing uh, mainly cloudy skies in the southeast and that steadier periods of rain starting to set up, especially overnight into early tomorrow morning for the Straits. Also, uh, the south coast of the island, Port of Basque, down towards the Burgio Ramy area, a very damp start with periods of drizzle. We have rainfall warnings in effect for the Straits on the Labrador side, and we have special weather statements in effect for Port of Basque, Burgio Ramy. And note that we are going to be seeing uh, for tomorrow those periods of rain at times heavy for that southwest coast, also up into the Straits region. Uh, southeastern Labrador inland areas, the Trans Labrador Highway will also likely start to get into some of those steadier periods of rain. And Happy Valley Goose Bay 
also will likely see some of those rains at times heavy moving in for the afternoon. For St. John's up through the northeast coast, a bit of drizzle possible early on, but I think we're going to be getting into that sun and cloud mix right throughout the day for tomorrow. We're talking about temperatures tomorrow that are going to be anywhere from 24 to 25 in St. John's through Central towards 23 in Cornerbrook and in that 20, 18 to 22 degree range along parts of the south coast. Again, Happy Valley Goose Bay with those afternoon rains moving in as will uh, Labrador City. So a Certainly a damper turning forecast for you folks and that rain really shoots through for Thursday night on the island. We're watching that rain that's going to crawl from west to east across the region for Thursday into Friday. And we're going to talk more about that with your complete forecast uh, with your seven day details coming up in just a few minutes. Peter. Well, the start of the school year has people thinking about the help kids with special needs are getting in the classroom. Up next, the province's education minister weighs in. Welcome back to here now. It was a big day for any school aged children that you may have had in your house as young people across the province headed back to class. Yeah, and just like that, the buses are ready to take them home. The first day's in the books. Students at Holy Heart in St. John's didn't seem too phased by it all, but as time passes, challenges will arise. 
Now this summer, the task force designed to address some of those challenges and improve education in the province released its findings. Yeah, front and center in the recommendations is the contentious issue of inclusive education. How can the system meet what's required for students with special needs as well as those who don't have them? You may recall the minister responsible for education telling here and now that the system isn't working. I see examples when I go around talking to teachers and visiting classrooms of where uh, the inclusive education model is uh, not working as intended. Well, Premier Dwight Ball's task force has given the government one year to implement 16 inclusive education recommendations. Yeah, here now is Anthony Germain caught up with Dale Kirby to discuss how he will give special education special treatment. Mr. Kirby, one of the findings in the task force over the summer is that when it comes to identifying students with special needs, there has to be a formal process for identifying those issues earlier. How are you going to achieve that? Well, I think in part we've already put one thing in place that will help with that. Full day kindergarten um, is something that it's in its second year now here in Newfoundland, Labrador. And one of the reasons why we wanted to bring that program into our schools is that it enables educators and the education system to more quickly assess uh, special education needs um, when they appear. Here in Newfoundland, Labrador, uh, we don't really test until grade four, right? And I think the literature, the research shows that it should be done much earlier than that. So we're in a situation where it really doesn't get identified until students have fallen behind a couple of grades. What are you gonna do specifically to, to make it happen earlier? Because kindergarten is one thing. A teacher might say, hey, this, this child has a hard time hearing. But and for some of those more complicated special needs, if you're not testing until grade four, it's costing the system a lot of money. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we there has been in the past a hesitancy uh, around doing early diagnosis. I think there's probably been concerns around labeling and so on. Uh, but as the the report shows, and these were uh, you know experts of some renown who worked on this task force for government, um, they indicate a need to do something um, earlier to do things a bit differently. For, you know, for example, we need to make sure uh, if there are um, uh, reports or diagnosis or assessments that are done in the child care setting, then that needs to go with the child to school. Uh, if there are assessments that are done through the health care system, then that needs to be more integrated in what's being done with school level assessments. So no, there's no doubt we can do things better and that there are advantages of doing things earlier. Surely you did not need this task force to tell you that because I think educators have been pointing out this wait time is has been excessive for a long time. And I'm not saying under Liberal government, under Conservative governments, yeah. this, is, this has been ongoing on for a long time. Well, you know, there weren't a lot of surprises in the report, to be quite honest with you. We knew that these issues uh, existed when we were in opposition. When I was an educator out of politics, uh, you know, I knew a lot of these issues uh, existed. It was important to put all of this on paper. It challenges us as a government, uh, as a department, uh, the school system, to deal with these uh, issues now. Some parents said, my child doesn't have special needs, but there are kids with special needs, and that's taking away the attention of a teacher to my child. Mm -hmm. And then you had parents with kids who had special needs saying the class is filled and there are too many other kids mm -hmm. with special needs. It's, what's your confidence level this can actually be fixed? Because it's, it's fairly broken. Inclusive education does not mean 100% inclusion in the same classroom all of the time. I've heard people tell stories about how, you know, they're in a their child's in a class or I'm a teacher in a class uh, and there's a, t a homeroom teacher there or a subject teacher. You've got one or more uh, instructional resource teachers, special education teachers. Then you might have several student assistants. So all of these adults all talking roughly the same time in the you know, sometimes, uh, you know, a, a relatively confined space, uh, you know, if you it's see. disruptive. Absolutely. Uh, so we need to have better sense than that, if you will. And this report really goes a long way uh, to ensuring that, you know, 
that we will do that. I mean, the onus is on us as leaders now in this government. And you. Do, yep. Absolutely, to do something about it. And as long as I'm in this role, as, an, as long as I'm part of this government, we will work towards addressing those issues. They're not easily solved, but children rely on us. Look, those kids back there playing on the playground, they can't advocate on their own behalf. They need us adults to advocate for them. We will do that, I assure you. Well, Dale Kirby, thank you very much. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. Well, still with inclusive education and preparing for the school year, all parents have to do a lot of work to get their children ready for the return to school. Yeah, but for some, like Dave Peddel and Heather Pellegrinetti, there's more work than most of us could imagine. Their son Daniel has cerebral palsy. Here now is Allison Sampson has our story. Dante Pellegrinetti is a playful, mischievous 10-year-old boy starting the fourth grade. But his parents, Heather and Dave, started getting ready for the next school year before a lot of parents could even imagine. In March, April, May, like by the time of the end of the school year, we're planning for the next school year. For Dante, it's more than outfitting him in the latest sneaker styles and fashionable clothes. These are ankle foot orthopedics. So these are custom made for him. And every year we get a new pair. So they strap onto his feet, these help him walk. And without them, he has a lot of trouble walking. With them also comes his sneakers, and these are keeping pace sneakers. They're great for his AFOs, so they just slide into the back like this. He slides his foot in, we strap him in, and he's ready to run. This one we're calling it his hygiene package. With Dante's CP, he's still, he doesn't have muscle control the same as everybody else, so his stomach muscles have a hard time holding when he has to go to the washroom or anything. So he needs to keep with him at all times. He needs extra change of clothes. He needs some diapers to help in case something happens. He needs baby wipes. So that's just one bag and that kind of gets, has me refilled a lot as the weeks and days go. Packing up Dante to go back to school looks like what some of us would take for a weekend getaway. His transportation, orthopedic, hygiene, technological, and education needs require a lot of stuff. Loading up the car is a two-trip job. We have school supplies like every other child, but we have extra school supplies. We have different scissors that needs to go to school with, and we have sensory products that need to go, things that go on these pencils. We have lots of little extras that Every year we were kind of like, did we remember? Did we remember? Did we remember? And we usually forget something. <laughs> There's always something because it's so much. And when the first day of school comes, we have everything with us. We have his iPad too, which he definitely has to have because all of his schoolwork is on his iPad as well too. So it's a lot to remember and we pile up the van and <laughs> go. This is Dante's fifth year at Hazelwood Elementary School. By now, his family's extraordinary school routine has settled into just a routine. So much to do to make his first day and the rest of the year as smooth as possible. We just want the best for Dante and we want him to have an education like every other child. We're Dante's advocates and if we fall down on the job, then Dante doesn't get the best that he, he deserves. Mm -hmm. So we work yeah. hard on that. <laughs> Allison Sampson, CBC Hi, News, St. John's. Good morning. How are you? The gas of the price of gas is expected to go up by 14 cents. You want to know why? Stick around. We're going to talk to George Murphy, and he's going to explain it to us.
Well, your wallet might be a little lighter tomorrow if you wait till then to fill up. As you know now, the price of gas is expected to jump by 14 cents overnight. Yeah, and the reason is Hurricane Harvey and the situation in Texas. Here now's Jeremy Eaton is at Costco tonight where the price of gas is lowest in St. John's. Jeremy? Well, Peter, gas is a hot commodity in this province, and there's a reason for that. We have a population of about 530,000 people, according to 2016 stats, but a staggering 690,000 registered vehicle, which creates long lineups like this. But now, why is gas going up 14 cents a liter? That's something that I cannot explain very well, but our guest, George Murphy, he can do a better job than I can. George, thanks for joining us tonight. No, thanks for having me. George, 14 cents seems like a big increase. Why is it going up by so much? Yeah, it is a big uh, increase, but not quite so big as what we had in 2005 with Katrina and Rita. And again, this time around, the same reasons are happening. Uh, nothing has been done about it. Uh, we've got the refineries that are shut down in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, no gas is getting refined down there right now, albeit some refineries are starting to come back online. Shortage of gas, about 25%. Uh, capacity taken out of the market, all of a sudden gas is becoming a valuable commodity and, and the price went up on, on the New York Mercantile Exchange. That happened, of course, directly in the heels of Harvey and we get to pay for it this week. We didn't pay for it last week when the event actually happened and, and that's basically what happened. Other centers got tagged already. So how did we avoid that for, because you posted on this about a week and a half ago that it was going to go up, so how did you know so far in advance? Uh, well, I had the numbers on it, and uh, at the time when Harvey hit over the weekend, of course, was was data that you would use in your next regulatory period. So it, it was only easy to predict that this event was going to happen because the numbers I had even on, the, on that Friday, for example, were well up. They averaged about 72 cents a, a litre. Uh, when you convert it over to Canadian versus 56 cents a litre at the last price setting. And since then, of course, gasoline starting to drop back a bit and uh, you came up with the average of 14 cents. So gas dropping back a little bit is something that a lot of people are going to want to know about. Yep. When can we expect to see the price dip now after it rises 14 cents overnight? That's starting to happen already with some places like this. OK, you look at Costco, you look at their neighbors, for example, Little Ultramar down the road. Uh, some of them are going to raise it up to the regulated maximum before they start getting their their various permissions, if you will, uh, from their various corporate heads and everything before they start dropping down the price. But the big determiner where prices are going to go, these people right here, they're going to be the ones to dictate exactly where everybody's going to go tomorrow, and most likely that's going to be down. So how can Costco pull off? Do they still making a profit if they're selling it at a buck sixteen point four cents a liter? Well, they are. Yeah, and and like I said, you know, there, there's there's a hefty margin there that they can operate by, and they're obviously using it. Number one, I guess, is an attractant for more customers for inside the store, and uh, it's a formula that works well with with Costco, I guess. And at the same time, you can tell by the lineups here, saving a dollar actually means a lot for an awful lot of people. They they feel like that they're, well, telling the other oil companies right now, unless you're going to drop your price. Uh, you can take it and head elsewhere or whatever, and these people are coming up here to get it. So it seems like Costco is good for competition in the city of St. John's. Best move that city of St. John's council ever made was giving Costco the go-ahead to put these pumps in several years ago. And that's what we were looking for as consumers. Uh, we just hope to find a formula one of these days to have competition everywhere in the province. Well, Mr. Murphy, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us. And Thanks if you're looking me. to save a few bucks... Might want to pop here in the line, buck 16.4 cents a liter. Reporting live for here and now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in St. John's. Well, this will take us to the weather now. We're still dealing with the impacts of the last hurricane. And of course now, Irma is causing a lot of damage in the Caribbean. That's right. Category 5 hurricane uh, will move north, but still headed towards the Dominican Republic. And of course, Haiti and has already hit other islands. Yes, uh, St. Eustatius is near St. Martin. Winds and rain from Irma hit there overnight. And that's where we've reached Newfoundlander Guy Beasley. He's working in the Caribbean repairing helicopters. So what sort of impact has Irma had on where you are? Uh, there's a lot of uh, property damage, um, utilities, uh, trees down, uh, roofs off, uh, that, that, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, no, no flooding here on this island. It's uh, 
it's, it's a dormant volcano, so uh, the water just uh, just runs away. Um, some of the neighboring islands here have been uh, hit pretty hard. Uh, St. Martin, which is just uh, 33 miles away from here, um, it uh, it had 100 and 175 mile an hour winds. So uh, there's been a lot of flooding over there. Uh, it's 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 devastated actually. So uh, I don't know, I don't know when they'll get. Uh, back up in business over there with the airport and everything. But, uh, yeah, just, just those 33 miles, it's a huge jump in, uh, in wind speed. So uh, the, the eye pretty much went, uh, went right, right over them. So how fortunate do you feel then when you look and see another island not very far away with a whole lot more devastation than what you guys have had to face? Well, pretty lucky, yeah, it was... Uh, it was a sleepless night, to say the least. Uh, I share a house here with two other guys, and I, I don't, I don't think any of us slept, uh, slept that soundly, especially once the wind really started to pick up around uh, 3:30, 4 o'clock, I guess, and that's when, uh, when we lost power. Uh, power did come back uh, around 11, so we're, uh, we're very happy. We're very happy for that, because it's, it's the Caribbean and. Stuff doesn't, stuff doesn't stay frozen in the, in the fridge too long once, once the power goes. So now we're very fortunate, that's for sure. Uh, cell service is still down, uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, Wi-Fi is, uh, is working real good. And we're going to leave the shutters up <laughs> because apparently there's another hurricane coming uh, right behind this one. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll go further than the work this one did. Well, glad to hear uh, you're safe, and thank you so much for speaking with me. No worries, Peter. All the best to everybody back home. Wow. Can't imagine. He said a sleepless night. I'm sure that's an understatement as you mm -hmm. would listen to that storm coming through. Uh, just unbelievable power. Yeah, because even though they didn't get the full brunt of it, it was still 140 kilometer an hour winds, so yeah. uh, still some damage and you never know exactly until you get see things the next morning how bad it's going to be we know what it's like in wreck house over a hundred you know so yeah. we have a sense of it but i mean the infrastructure down there is is pretty fragile compared yeah. to what we have so. hard, hard, hard to comprehend for mm -hmm. sure uh he mentioned that next mm -hmm. hurricane we actually have count them not just one not just two we have three hurricanes now in the Atlantic Basin, and this is uh, the first time that we've had three hurricanes at the same time since 2010. And we have Jose, we have Irma, and we have Katia, which is uh, likely going to be a Mexico issue. But the interesting part about Katia is it's actually, you can see some of the moisture coming out of that system into the Gulf, and that is actually being pulled up into this frontal boundary, which is moving up the eastern seaboard, and then into our neck of the woods. So everything's connected here. And while we won't be dealing with Irma or Katia itself, we will certainly be watching the tropical moisture over the next couple of days. And it will certainly be an impact here. We're already talking about the temperatures that have been on the rise. Mid 20s on the menu for most of us today and again tomorrow. Also that tropical air that those dew points that we typically see 20 plus down in Florida when we visit and down towards the southeast parts of the US. Those are the types of dew points we're talking about tomorrow, 18, 19, 20, very tropical air feeling. And with that tropical air mass, we're watching for the potential for some rain at times heavy it's beginning tomorrow afternoon, certainly through tomorrow night into Friday for the southwest coast. Port of Basque, Bergio Ramia under a special weather statement. We also have rainfall warnings in effect for the Labrador side of the Straits. Pretty good chance of 50 millimeters or more there by the time we get to the end of Friday. So here's how it plays out. Those heaviest rains pushing up through New Brunswick tomorrow, but even up towards the southeastern parts of Labrador. By Thursday, late day, certainly heavier rains uh, tracking in across southern Labrador and the potential again for those rains at times heavy over the southwest coast of the island. It's drizzle to start the day across Metro, even into the Clarenville region. That retreats, that fog and drizzle retreat back to the coastline through the afternoon where it will linger, looking at a pretty good chance of sunny breaks from the Humber Valley right through central to St. John's tomorrow. 
and into Labrador. Again, I think that north coast is dry, but certainly clouds dominating and those rains moving in through the day across southern parts of Labrador. Now, watch your timeline here. Thursday night in through Friday, this frontal boundary really start to roll in. Through the day Friday, rain at times heavy, pushing from the west into central. And then by late day Friday, setting up here in the east with some gradual clearing in behind. Still some scattered shower chances, but certainly the heaviest rains do march eastward through the day on Friday across the island. Dew points still very high and again still very muggy in eastern Newfoundland, but drying out a little bit uh, over the western half of the island. This is where things get interesting. Saturday, forecast models have been basically stalling this frontal boundary out over the Avalon and eastern Newfoundland for Saturday and possibly into Sunday as well. So the forecast for Saturday looking wet, 16, 17 degrees. Central uh, western Newfoundland uh, looking like you'll be on the outside looking in here and Labrador looking at a sun cloud mix on Saturday as well. Should note that some models are moving that band, this tropical moisture offshore for Sunday. But the Euro model here that uh, I'm showing you, it's been pretty consistent keeping that overhead for Sunday. New low develops into Monday. And so what we've got is late Friday, Saturday, Sunday into Monday. A very wet setup here for eastern Newfoundland with some heavy rain potential with that tropical moisture, especially Saturday, lingering into Sunday. Monday, Tuesday looking wet as well. Again, a bit of a dry out for Saturday in central, but I think that rain might clip back in later day Sunday. Certainly the clouds drying, uh, clouds dominating and western Newfoundland. You can see some sunny breaks in the mix uh, for Sunday as well. Uh, clearing out in Labrador again, you folks will be uh, really seeing that area of high pressure move in nicely overhead Saturday. Well, it's time to meet our young athlete of the day. Nine year old Jordan Squires is from Paradise and this is his first year playing baseball. Jordan loves batting and playing first base. Great work, Jordan. You're today's young athlete of the day. I feel so honored. I was so excited to play, like I said, and I'm just so happy to be a part of this great cause. Three downtown St. John's bars raised thousands for the Texas flood relief efforts last night. The musical fundraiser raked in more than $3,500 for the Red Cross. More than 22 performers in total took part.
twice a day, people in Cornerbrook hear that sound. The pulp and paper mill whistle signals the start and stop of the workday. It blows at 8 a.m. and 4 in the afternoon and has since the 1920s. It also acts like Morse code for the Mills Fire Brigade. The CBC's Gary Moore took a history tour recently and you can read about that and more on our website, cbc.ca slash nl. Well, from blowing whistles to blowing winds, we've been telling you about Hurricane Irma. Canadian airlines are sending extra flights down to the Caribbean as well as South Florida to get Canadians out of the area. But some people won't be able to get out as quickly as they'd like. Ron Charles has that story. Canadians arriving home from locations in Hurricane Irma's path fall into two groups. Those relieved to have ended their Caribbean vacations early to flee to safety. We went away for five days and yeah, it's, yeah. we're happy to be back. And those worried about leaving their vacation homes unattended in places like Fort Myers, Florida. So I'm a little concerned, but um, we'll have to see what happens. But I'm a little concerned on, uh, it, that it may do some damage. Airlines have been adding flights to the Caribbean and southern Florida to ferry Canadians home. But not everyone is getting out as early as they would like. The only flight that was available from, uh, from, from exiting Fort Myers was through WestJet, and they were incredible to help us. But it doesn't leave until 8.50 p.m. on Saturday night, and the storm is due to hit this area at 2 a.m. Sunday morning. Some travelers admit to missing the incessant hurricane warnings and headed on Caribbean vacations unaware. Adriana Prosser arrived in the Dominican Republic on Monday. It's definitely changed from a vacation to an exercise in anxiety. Um, uh, you have to have your sense of humor at this point. Uh, there's no use in, in freaking out. Prosser has no idea when she can get a flight home. She says plan B is to take any flight anywhere safer. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a lot of our family history is in that hole right now. Everything from the family photos to the dining room table, even the car keys, all at the bottom of a sinkhole beneath their home. I only have like a couple shirts, three pairs of pants, just some random stuff I could salvage on the way out. <laughs> 16-year-old Julia Stricky and her mother, Heather, were asleep inside the home early Sunday morning when they heard what they thought was a home invasion. We could hear the noises. We could hear what sounded like TVs being taken off the walls. We went into my mom's room and we hid in her bathroom with the door locked and all of a sudden the power... Our apologies. We didn't get to actually introduce that item to you and we want to set it up properly. So here's what this story is about. A house that collapsed into a sinkhole in Hance County, Nova Scotia early Sunday morning will have to be torn down. The family still isn't sure whether insurance will cover the cost, but the mother and daughter who were inside at the time are telling a dramatic story about what they thought was happening when their home started to sink. Here's the CBC's Kayla Hounsel. Well, a lot of our family history is in that hole right now. Everything from the family photos to the dining room table, even the car keys, all at the bottom of a sinkhole beneath their home. I only have like a couple shirts, three pairs of pants, just some random stuff I could salvage on the way out. 16-year-old Julia Stricky and her mother Heather were asleep inside the home early Sunday morning when they heard what they thought was a home invasion. We could hear the noises, we could hear what sounded like TVs being taken off the walls. We went into my mom's room and we hid in her bathroom with the door locked and all of a sudden the power went off and there was a huge crash of glass and we thought, oh no, they figured out we're here. We um, got some weapons, I guess, so my mom had a nail file and I had the base of a mirror and we went and we hid in the closet just um, on the phone with 911. It went on for 25 minutes before first responders arrived and the 911 dispatcher told the family there was no home invasion, but rather the floor had collapsed up to 10 meters into a sinkhole. He said, grab a few things in your arms. You need to get out fast. Stricky's husband and youngest daughter were out of town at the time. He says the home is still moving and will have to come down. Sooner rather than later is uh, their want and their advice. The big question still unanswered is whether the insurance company will cover the cost of the damage here. Chris Stricky says his policy covers the house collapse, so he's hopeful, but so far hasn't been given any guarantees. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Nova Scotians, you know, diligently pay host insurance monthly and annually 
for this sort of situation. As difficult as it is to lose their home and everything inside it, the family says the alternative would have been worse. If someone did rob us, like we would have our house, but I don't think I would have been ever able to sleep in there again. This was our dream home and we were very happy here. Uh, we're still here and uh, we don't have to feel bad about humanity. On the contrary, the family has been overwhelmed by the generosity of their community and say they can't be sad when they know so much goodness exists around them. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Falmouth. If skies are clear tonight, you'll want to look up because, as Ryan mentioned earlier, you may get a chance to see the northern lights. The U.S. Space Weather Prediction Center has issued a strong geomagnetic storm watch. That means there's a good chance to see those amazing colors dancing across the sky, assuming the sky stays clear for you. We'll be back. This next video has more than a million views on social media and counting. Oh! Oh! Huh! Oh. God did it! Oh! Are you... Marie, will you stop looking into Oh! A bat on the loose in a home in County Kerry, Ireland. Teague Fleming's whole family, even the dog, at a loss uh, with how to get the creature out of the kitchen. Finally, the father manages to wrangle it using a towel, but not before it gets very up close with the cameraman. This video, see, yeah, he jumps up there on the chair to try and, oh, th there you go, you can see it. <laughs> Whoop. <laughs> it's like the Irish mother I'm stuck video. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, just enough time for a picture of the day. Courtesy of Krista Bailey, this one, comes from beautiful Fogo Island and Island Harbor and a great picture here. Uh, so nice. We'll soak up these scenes because uh, it's already September. Uh, lots of time left, but nice. Summer is indeed setting on us. <laughs> yes, nice. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> you had, Hold on to that optimism. Your yeah, extended maybe. forecast was pretty good. Anyway, that is our program. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you here tomorrow. Good night. Good night. <laughs>